If you're not full after that, I'm not sure what it would take to fill you up. I, uh, I get to be here before you guys and watch and participate in the rehearsal. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on during that time. But, but it was so clear this morning that the Holy Spirit was heavy um, in preparation to bring you guys to worship. And y'all responded this morning. Such a blessing. And I, God is doing something special here at Coastal. We don't deserve what He's doing. But we are so grateful that He has chosen to use this vessel. And in our men's ministry, each week we have, give or take, 80 guys either on Tuesday morning or Tuesday night that are getting together, that are surrounding themselves with the Word of God. And it's evident to me. As I looked around the room this morning and and was observing the worship time during the music, guys are leading the worship. And men, can I just say, thank you. Your families need that. They need to see you worshiping our Creator like you believe it. They do. Um, I'm full for a lot of reasons this morning. Last week, you guys blessed all of the staff uh, with an appreciation, multiple gifts. I I can't even express gratitude throughout this week. Things have been coming in, precious cards, gifts, and y'all are so wonderful to remember us and to think of us that way. It is our honor to serve you, and we just count it a joy to be able to worship alongside of you, Uh, and you encourage us daily, and uh, we appreciate you as well. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, T and I. Spent Sunday afternoon going through cards and looking at things as I know the other staff families did as well and and tears and laughter and just joy that's there. So thank you so much for your generosity, your thoughtfulness, your care, and uh, it's obvious and we are grateful to you for that. Man, we, uh, we've had a, quite a journey through Epic Faith, right? Today we're going to conclude Epic Faith. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here at Coastal, and I get the honor to speak to you today, and, and I'm grateful for that. And, uh, you know, we've looked at so many facets and so many different things concerning faith, uh, just in general what faith means, what it is. We've looked at Joshua and Caleb and Rahab. Uh, we've looked at Gideon. We looked at David. Uh, Last week, we looked at Peter and the other disciples and what created faith. And today, we're going to look at a character and an event in Scripture that's the culmination. Pastor Daniel did a great job this morning talking about the Reformation and when the 95 Theses were nailed to the doors and a rebellion was put in place that we were able to worship God and we must be allowed to worship God. And it is because of the event that happens that we're going to discuss this morning that we should be able to worship God in a way of reckless abandon where we don't care who's around, we don't care what they think, we don't care anything about it because we serve a God that is risen from the dead and He has declared victory over death and hell. That's the God that we serve. And it is such an amazing thing. And when we look at our faith, hopefully some of you have been able to grow your faith through this series I know great discussions have occurred in life groups as we have looked at the things that faith brings to us, how we can develop our faith, why we should be able to have faith in general. And it's an exciting thing on this faith journey. Sometimes there's dry spots, right? Sometimes we don't hear and we don't know. We don't understand what's going on. And then sometimes it's so rich and tangible, you can almost touch it. And you feel the faith that is there and God growing you. And I encourage you, maybe this morning your faith is weak. 
That's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. But don't abandon what you know to be true in the midst of trial. Because He is faithful even when we are not. So I encourage you with that. If you've got your Bibles this morning and you want to open up to Luke chapter 23, we're going to spend our time in the latter part of Luke 23 this morning. We're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus. And just before He breathes His last breath, there is a dialogue and a, a scene that's going on between Jesus and the crowd that has crucified him and the soldiers that are there and all the things that are going on. And then there are two, some versions of scripture call them male factors that are also involved in this scene. And one is on either side of Jesus as he is being crucified. And we're going to look this morning at some conversation that is had between them. And you may not think of these characters when you think of the faith journey, but I pray this morning that God will reveal to you that there is epic faith in this scene and it applies to your life. So if you've got your Bibles open, if you don't, the verses will be on the screen. We're going to start in verse number 33 and we're going to read this and I like for you guys to stand in honor of reading the word of God. So if you will stand with me, follow along as I read this morning. Verse number 33 and it says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's Christ, the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. Coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was, as he was saying this, Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Imagine, if you will, being present for this event. Just a week prior, the people are shouting praises, Hosanna in the highest. Worthy is the Lamb. Some few days later, they're screaming, crucify him hurling insults. He's being beaten mercilessly, led to the cross, the hill of Golgotha, so weak that he had to have someone else carry his cross for him to the place of his execution, the place of the skull. And when he gets there, his honor is to be labeled across the top as the king of the Jews and placed between two criminals, one on either side of him. And as we read this account and we look at what's going on, I want you to see three specific characters in this account and see how they apply to your world. The first one that we're going to see here are the slanderers. So let's look at the slanderers first. There are several people that are mentioned in this group of people. We see that we have the rulers, 
This is the Jewish people and the Roman rulers who were trying to get rid of Jesus. He had been a problem for them for a long time. They wanted to get rid of this problem once and for all. So they were sitting there and his accusation was that they, he claimed to be God, that he was the Messiah. And they felt that this was blasphemy. So he was brought up on charges of blasphemy. And this is why he was being crucified, claiming to be God. Now, mind you, they could not present one witness against him that he had done anything wrong throughout this. As a matter of fact, Pilate, the ruler of this time, said, look, I don't find anything wrong with him. You guys need to let him go. And you've got a choice to make between Barabbas and Jesus. Which one do you want? Now, Barabbas was the one who was supposed to be on this cross. See, we had two criminals already. Barabbas was the third, and he was supposed to be in the middle. But they wanted Barabbas instead of Jesus to be released. And that's what happened. So Jesus took the place of Barabbas, very symbolic of you and I, on that cross. And I have to imagine in my mind's eye that the two criminals were kind of out a little bit ahead of Jesus' cross and they were kind of turned in so that all could see each other just because of the way the things are are said here and what's going on and these thieves robbers if you will are able to read the inscription above Jesus head now they had probably at some point encountered Jesus they had probably heard something they really weren't interested but they had probably heard something about who he was and this constant talking about the kingdom that Jesus preached on and invited others to be part of his kingdom And as we see this set unfold, all these slanderers are going up and they're spitting on him. They're yelling at him. They're mocking him. Look, the Roman people in this time took this kind of slander so seriously that if it could be proven, they could actually be excommunicated from their families if they were found guilty of what they were being charged of. This was not just a calling somebody a name it was vitriol it was to its core hatred and trying to destroy someone's character and someone's person and the rulers are doing this when you look at the verses that are there it says the rulers were casting this kind of Uh, It says, sneering at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. Then the Roman soldiers, they had already had fun doing what they do and exacting pain unjustly on Jesus. And they were mocking him, offering him sour wine to drink, laughing. They had cast lots for his garments. They had done all of these things. Give him a crown of thorns to mock him. And now, last but not least, as he's hanging on the cross, he's between two robbers. Now, this is not your average, hey, give me all your money kind of robber that takes your wallet and runs away. These guys were known to be robbers that were violent in the way that they did. If you will, equate it to the account of the Good Samaritan where the robbers attacked him as he was on his way beat him, stole all of his goods, stripped him of his clothes, and left him for dead. This was the kind of guys that we're dealing with here. They were known. They were guilty. They were someone you did not want to deal with. And these were the friends, if you will, that Jesus had on his sides. And every one of them, even the repentant thief that we'll talk about here in a few moments, Even he was casting aspersion to Jesus. If you look at Mark chapter 15, it talks about how both of them were hurling insults at Jesus. Matthew chapter 27 talks about both of them were hurling insults, but something happened. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's such an amazing thing to see what was going on because when you look at 
the temptation that they were saying, hey, if you're the Christ, why don't you just save yourself and us? That's what the one criminal was saying to him. The rulers of Israel, they were coming up and they were throwing things at him and they were spitting and they were calling all these names and everything else and said, hey, if you're the Christ of God, then why don't you save yourself? You can't even come off the cross. Now, as a man, when you're challenged, Harold, can I get a witness? <laughs> oh, yeah? Let's go. Can you imagine the restraint that it took for Jesus to stay on that cross with us in his mind? Y'all, he chose to stay there. There was nothing on this earth that kept him on that cross except for his love for you and me. Amen. <laughs> nothing. Because he could have called the angels to wipe out everything there. He could have stepped down on that cross, off of that cross, and his wrath be realized instantly because he was God in the flesh. But you know what he did? He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They don't understand. You see, the thing that we need to understand is for Jesus to save himself or save anyone, he could not save himself. For him to be able to save anybody else, he could not save himself. And the temptations that they were hurling at him, just come off the cross. Come off the cross if you're the king, prove it. We want to see what's going on. And he was saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're asking for. Because if I get off this cross, it's eternal damnation forever. They don't know what they're doing. The Son of God. When we're facing struggles and we're in the middle of the battle and there's other people that are mocking Jesus or making fun of Christians and we're kind of one of those closet Christians and we don't really let ourselves out people know that you know maybe we go to church or whatever the case is but they don't know how real it is in our life and when all of a sudden things come up I mean we've been dealing with abortion and transgenderism and all these hot topics that come out and Christians are painted in a light of hate, haters and bigotry and all this other kind of stuff and we're made to look like this and when these discussions come up around the water cooler at work what do we do? Is our faith solid? When we get the news from the doctor or we get the letters from our spouse's attorney or we lose that job or things go wrong in a very, very bad way and we don't understand what's happening, what do we do? Do we waver in our faith? Jesus, I mean, come on, God, I'm doing everything I can to live right. Surely, if that's the case, you would let me be successful and happy. Do you waver in your faith when things are not successful and happy? Let's look at a few verses here. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Look at these verses. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Going through struggles? Seek God's face. He will give you wisdom. He may not give you answers. But he will give you wisdom. But he must ask in faith. Without doubting. Whew, getting tough. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect anything from God. Because being double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Y'all look. If you read the beginning of chapter 1 of James, it says expect trials. Expect problems. Expect your faith to be shaken to the core. 
And when you face that, number one, count it joy because God thought you worthy of going through this trial to give glory to his name. And then number two, trust him. Ask in faith. Stay solid. Don't waver. Don't bob around in the sea being knocked over by the waves and trying to stand up and swim over them and all this other kind of stuff. And you start out here and all of a sudden you end up way down there. Don't do that. Don't be double-minded because that person can expect nothing from God because he has never failed. When you hear the slanderers, maybe when you are a slanderer, I mean, let's be real. Jesus is calling you back to him. Seek his face. Call to him in wisdom. Look to who he is. Because here's the thing. A life marked by faith trusts. Even when everyone else seems to unite in doubt. A life marked by faith trusts when everybody else is doubting. Pastor Aaron, I don't see any light. Trust him. Trust him. Let him build your faith through this. None of us grow in our faith when we're walking through the roses. We grow in our faith when we're fighting for our next breath. Because we know we don't have anywhere to look but up. You say, but Pastor Aaron, he's just, he's not answering. He's silent. He was silent for 400 years to the Israelites. Are you still going to trust him? Or are you going to fall into the category of the slanderers? It's an easy trap to fall into. Don't fall into this. The hatred of Jesus was due to the consistency of his message. If you're consistent with your message, you will be hated just as he is. But you will be rewarded in heaven by him. Don't fall into the trap of being a slanderer of Christ. The second thing I want you guys to see is the seeker. At some point... One of the two male factors or criminals had a change of heart. This guy was a hardened criminal. We've already talked about this. This is not somebody who was a softy. But when you come into a situation where you know your life is going to end, I understand that there's a lot of things that you consider in your, about your life. And I have to picture this one criminal... Maybe all of a sudden, because this went on for six hours, right? This whole scene went on for six hours. The agony, the pain, the insults, all the things that are going on. Each one of these men are struggling for breath. They have to push themselves up just to take another breath and to be able to speak anything. And somehow, one of these guys, in the middle of all of this, starts to change. And I, and I have to wonder... Is it because he heard Jesus continue to pray? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Most of the time when people that are guilty are in a situation where they're having to pay the punishment, they become angry. They become resentful. They become retaliatory. They want to reach out. They want to lash out. They want to drag everybody down. They'll start hurling curses. They'll start everything that they can to pull everything away from themselves and put it on other people. They'll blame. They'll do whatever they can to try to absolve themselves. But Jesus was completely different as he's going through the agony that none of us could even possibly stand to. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. In verses 40 and 42, we see this change of heart. 
in this criminal. And here's what he says. He says, the other answered and rebuking the first criminal said, do you not even fear God? (laughs) What an interesting comment from a guy who was guilty of murder and theft and robbery and everything else. And he's hanging on a cross getting his rightly deserved punishment. And he looks and preaches the gospel to the other criminal and anybody else who's standing around. Only God can do this. He's hearing all this stuff and he's seeing Jesus' reaction and he's watching all this stuff and he reads King of the Jews and he's considering, it seems like I remember somebody saying something about the kingdom and coming into his kingdom and he did a lot of miracles in the name of God and maybe there's some truth to this. And then he starts looking at the other criminal who is doing exactly what you would expect of a guilty person getting ready to go down. And he looks at him and he says, perhaps, that's, that's me. That's my hatred. And then, that's love. And he's not, I don't understand. And then he looks at the other criminal and says, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. wait. Do you not even fear God? What a question. Because he had to examine his own heart. Do I fear God? Do I? What, what do I have going on here? What we see is this. When we truly examine Jesus in our lives, the more likely our hearts willingly change. Hey, y'all, are you seeking this morning? Are you tuning in online and you're at the end of your rope? You don't understand? Can I call you this morning to examine Jesus Christ? Examine who he was. Examine how he lived his life. Examine what he did. There are multitudes of people who set out to prove that Jesus was a liar. That what he claimed was absolutely not possible or true. And they surrendered to God in the face of denial. Why? Because they truly examined who Jesus was and their hearts were turned. When you look into the face of love, you cannot deny it. Jesus is calling you today. Are you seeking who he is? Are you looking for what he has for you? This criminal who started out hurling insults all of a sudden became his defendant and he became humble. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 says that you need to be humbled so that God will exalt you at the proper time. And that's what this criminal did. He humbled himself before God. He looked at everything that was going on and the reality of what was there. He said, I think this is true. I've got to be part of this. I've got to examine what this is. And the more he watched and the more he saw and the more he understood, he said, I've got to have it. (laughs) I've got to have it. And then he asked Jesus the most beautiful words. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about, think about the dynamic of that phrase for just a second. The disciples were where during this time? They were hiding, peeking around the corner, running away, trying to figure out everything because Jesus had been with them for three years telling them that he was going to die, that he was going to raise from the dead, that if his kingdom was not here on earth. It was a future kingdom. It was something that they needed to be part of. And during this time, they're hiding. 
And the criminal says, remember me when you come into your kingdom as you die. That doesn't even make any sense. Because our understanding of a kingdom is it's something here on earth that's established and you're a ruler. How are you going to die and be a king? But that criminal grasps something that no one else there seemed to. His kingdom's not here. He has more power. And he, in his minuscule amount of understanding of who God was, said, remember me. Remember me. When you come into your kingdom. (laughs) Y'all, you don't have to know everything about God to trust him. You don't have to have all the answers to believe. You don't have to do any of that. When you see this, you truly see the ABCs of salvation. This guy, he says, you and I deserve this punishment. He's innocent. A, admit that you are a sinner. And he looked at Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. B, believe that Christ is the only way to salvation. And C, call on the name of Jesus. That's what this criminal did on the cross, simple as can be. This is the gospel in its simplest form. Admit, believe, call. Have you done that? Have you done that? Well, I'm not that bad. Yes, you are. So am I. But, I mean, compared, no, you. They'll stand and talk for themselves. You'll stand and talk for you. Admit that you are a sinner. Remember me when you come into your kingdom You're the only way. Pastor Aaron, you're narrow-minded. Yes, I am. You know why? Because John 15 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Him. Narrow-minded, yes. I believe. Do you believe? The last thing, I'm running out of time. Lastly, we see the Savior in the most important part of this whole thing. The Savior. Father, forgive them. This was not a prayer of salvation for the people that were there casting insults to Him. He was not forgiving them of their sins to save their souls. See, because the thing that we miss about this is their ignorance was surrounded around who He was you get that their ignorance was about who he was not the fact that they were executing an innocent person their ignorance they didn't understand who he was Jesus was asking for God to make it understood to them of what they were doing of who they were killing so that their hearts could be turned to him as well They were committing an act. All of them knew an innocent man was being killed for no reason. That was intentional. There were sacrifices back in Moses' day for the things that they were ignorant of. But not the intentional things. These people were ignorant of who Jesus was. They denied it. They didn't want anything to do with that. When we see Jesus between these three thieves in front of this religious crowd, you know what? I think each of us can find ourselves somewhere at that scene. Maybe we should be hanging beside Jesus, guilty. Maybe we're in the crowd just kind of following along and joining in in casting aspersion on Jesus. 
Maybe we're doubting who he was. Whatever it may be, I think you can probably find yourself at this setting. But the Savior is making intercession for you. He's calling for you to trust him. Just as he did. Now look, Jesus turns his attention to this criminal. And he looks at him and he says, Today, today you'll be with me in paradise. Isn't it interesting? We ask Jesus to save us from future torment in hell. And he does that. He secures us. But we often fail to see that he has released us from present guilt and shame. Some of you came just to hear that this morning. You need to lay down your guilt. If you placed your trust in Jesus, He has forgiven that past, present, and future. He has forgiven you if you have placed your trust in Him. Don't wallow in guilt. Don't find yourself stuck in shame. If he declares it over, it's over. And this criminal who was guilty as charged, dying for his sin at the last moment, Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. I love this. This criminal depicts Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you have an understanding from your childhood or whatever else that your salvation is dependent on how good you can be and what your works are, get rid of that. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not something that you can do, but it's all what He's done. Because if you could do it, then you could brag about it. It's not of our works because no one can boast. This criminal had no other option. He didn't get baptized. He didn't have time to go back and make up for the things he did wrong. He didn't have time to say all these prayers. He didn't have time to do any of this stuff. It had nothing to do with him and all to do with the person in the middle on the skull. If you're trying to get there on your own, you're frustrated and I know that you are because you can't. Trust him. Trust him today. The choice is clear. Are you a slanderer? Are you a seeker? Are you looking to the Savior? Bow your heads if you will and close your eyes. If you're here this morning and maybe you saw yourself in this scene. Maybe you're looking at your own life and you're thinking, yeah, I'm trying to blame everybody else. I'm trying to do all this other stuff and I need to lay it down and trust Him. He's calling to you today. This is the most epic faith step that you can take is to stop trusting yourself and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not about the words that you say, it's about the heart response to Jesus and if you've never made the decision to place your trust in him today is your day call on his name ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you of your sin and he will maybe this morning you've wavered in your faith and you've not been consistent he extends forgiveness to you too call on his name and repent Lord, we thank you. We praise you. 
this scene at Golgotha where you were in the middle of these two thieves and in the middle of this hostile crowd and you called out, Father, forgive them. And you looked at this thief who deserved everything that he was getting and gave grace that was undeserved. And you do the same for us. And I pray if there's someone in this room, someone tuning in throughout the country or the world today, listening to this message and they've never made that decision that today they would do that and place their trust in you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.